Hello and welcome to Sandhills GDPR Enterprise Architect Impact Webcast. In this part two of our three part webcast, we will focus on the application architecture and impact analysis. Please make sure to visit our YouTube channel, Sandhill Consultants, to view part one. During our webcast, we will outline the basics of process design to ensure that applications that involve personally identifiable and sensitive information are conceived with privacy, explicit consent, and lawful processing in mind. I'll be introducing our two presenters shortly who will be speaking on today's webcast, but first a few housekeeping notes. This webcast is being recorded and we will follow up by sending out a link of the recording to all attendees in the coming days. In addition, if attendees have any questions, please use the dialog box to submit the questions. At the end of the webcast, we will include the answers to all the questions in our follow-up communications. And with that, let me introduce our presenters. We have two very knowledgeable data management professionals with us on the call today. Don Soulsby, who is a certified CMI, DMM, EDME, and is Santol Consultant's Vice President of Enterprise Architecture Strategies. He has and continues to be at the forefront of metadata intelligence for many, many years. Jeff Giles is a principal architect with Sandal Consultants and is a key practitioner in the field of data management, and you're listening to myself, Robert Lutton. I'd also like to introduce our technology partner uh, for this webcast series. I'm sure a lot of folks know that when it comes to data modeling, Erwin is the first name that comes to mind, being a trusted name in the modeling industry for over 30 years. Lately, many folks may not know that Erwin is now its own company and has been expanded to include offerings such as the Data Foundation platform, which we'll talk about later on in the uh, presentation. This Data Foundation platform leverages enterprise architecture, business process modeling, and data governance. We will be using Erwin's business process modeling solution as a basis for the technology solution during our presentation. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Don to start the session. Don. Thank you, Robert. Well, the clock is ticking. In fact, the countdown is 259 days and five hours, in fact, till the law comes into effect. So let's speak then about what this is all about. In the seminar series so far, we've talked about the critical data elements, and we talked about the identification, classification, and how to build a data inventory. So part one really is about knowing what your data is. Part two, we're gonna talk about impact analysis, as Robert mentioned, around the design, consent verification, and lawful processing of personal information. So just a brief review of what the GDPR actually is. It's a European Union set of regulations that was actually implemented in May 2016, but two years were added onto the enforcement timeframe to allow companies to get prepared. Fundamentally, the involved parties are three actual types of people. One is the actual data subject. That's the person around which the identifiable or sensitive information is. The data controller who accepts on behalf of the individual data subject by explicit consent and collection of the information and understanding of how it is processed. And then the third person involved or the third organizational person involved is the data processor who acts on the controller's behalf, but the data controller is ultimately accountable for all processing, whether they do it themselves or it is done by an agent or data processor. So what are the guiding principles? Well, fundamentally, that the rights now of who owns and manages personal information, it belongs to the individual. And as such, then, that data privacy has to be created by all the systems that are, are done to collect, manage, and maintain personal information, that data privacy is considered part of the basic design principles. One of the key elements of that, of course, is the notion of lawful processing, that only personally identifiable and sensitive information can be used when explicit consent is granted. And again, part of that also means that a personal set of information where there is a data breach must be reported back to the individual at a very specific time. So what effectively is happening then is that personal data is included in many systems in many locations. That data ownership and control now passes to the individual. So if you think about it now as your personal identifiable and sensitive information, you in fact own the copyright and can only grant it by explicit consent. What technically it means is we've gone really from an age of data protection where we worry about security and protecting firewalls and things like that 
So the notion of identifying private and sensitive information and then managing it. So what we did in the first session is we really talked about the what, which is really all about that landscape, all that data you have out in your organizations. And then identifying and classifying using the concepts of critical data elements to really highlight which are the most important pieces of information. So in this second set of, of webinars, we're gonna look at the how. We're gonna talk about the applications now, and really in the risk management world, we're really talking about the detection aspects of it. So how is the data used? If we look at this from a perspective of a management process, there are inputs to a process and outputs, and the process we're in is the data management, or frankly, the data manufacturing business. Because until the point where a hammer hits a nail, you in fact, regardless of what institution, enterprise, private, or commercial, or governmental, you are in the data business. So if I look at IDEF, which was the uh, part of the ICAM integrated computer aided manufacturing process, it says not only do process have inputs and outputs, but there are key controls that must be put upon it. And then there are mechanisms by which you manage the process. So that's really what we're gonna be talking about today. The inputs and outputs were the data, we're gonna talk about the process itself today, and by, by design, it will be have privacy involved. And we're gonna look at the key control processes and certainly some of the mechanisms to help you manage that process. So the first thing we're gonna look at is privacy by design, the consent verification, and the lawful processing. So as we did in phase one of these webinars, we talked about this family tree that went from MRP2 to ERP. And frankly, as we started to discuss the notion of having DRP, if you think about the notions. So the first element was MRP1, which was materials requirements planning, which is all about inventory, and we talked about those in the first session and bills of materials. So today we're really gonna talk about the evolution in the materials world, going from materials requirements planning to manufacturing resource planning, which of course we know has led to the ERP type of systems that are enterprise resource planning, and tongue firmly in cheek, we are really talking now about data resource planning. So it carries the same sort of elements as MRP1 and MRP2, but it's dealing with data as the resource we are now trying to manage. So if we look at MRP2, it now became, the acronym stayed the same, but the, the wording became different. It is manufacturing resource planning. And it was talking about business information and the integration into the systems. So effectively it was taking the things we learned from MRP1 which were the bills materials and the data inventory and all the structures and hierarchies of these bills of material and now inserting them into the manufacturing process. So this is effectively what we'd like to talk about today as it with relative to private, personally identifiable and sensitive information. So as we start, does data management need to care? Well, again, a little cartoon says, before I write my name on a board, I'll need to know how you plan to use the data. Let me call my lawyer. This is really, as we looked at the GDPR issues, we saw that a lion's share of information on the web right now is about the legal concerns and how it's going to be pro progressing over the next, as they say, 10 to 15 years. We're gonna look at it from the data side rather than the legal side. So the first thing we're gonna look at now, of course, is privacy by design. So by design and default is how it's described in the regulation. By design, it means implementing data protection principles Data minimization is one of them in particular, and we'll get into what that means in just a bit. And to integrate the necessary safeguards all the way through the design process of systems. So again, we're not talking about just the gate on the front door. We're talking about all the systems inside the house. By default means that you ensure that only personal data that is necessary for a specific purpose to which the data was collected with express, explicit consent, and it to be only used for the extent of that processing for a specified period of time and where that data is processed and managed. So what it really means from data privacy by design as we start with a set of business requirements and we end up with a series of product production applications, every element of the design process needs to have elements of data privacy built into it. So from the analysis, design, development process, data privacy must be part of that selection process. Basic principles of it are the privacy by design. Privacy is the default as you start to build systems and collect and manage and distribute them. It's embedded to the design and architecture of all the IT systems. So it is more, again, than just data protection. It needs to be fully functional. 
it has to go through all of the design aspects and certainly all of the applications. And the security needs to be end-to-end -end rather than just at the very end, which is typically application level security. And to prove the point, there has to be visibility and transparency. And part of the regulations of the act for the data controllers will be providing that notion of visibility and transparency. So what it means from a design perspective, as we saw in the first seminar, we talked about how to do this as a forward engineering exercise by identifying your critical data elements and then reverse engineering from all, all the data landscape you have out there and effectively meeting in the middle. So finding our CDEs using the Irwin data modeling tool, we now have our private and sensitive data and we now pass that over to the processing world. And this is where the notion of data privacy by design. So it's the design of the applications that we're now gonna be talking to. So we start with a very recognizable thing for those in the data modeling world, which is an entity relationship diagram. What happens then is we take the information from the Irwin data modeler and we pass it over to the Irwin business process tool. And you'll notice then as it moved over in the process tool, we can highlight areas that have the private and sensitive data. So now they carry with them this piece of information that the information is sensitive and wherever now we connect that piece of information, that data object, it carries with it that characteristic that says I'm private and sensitive data. And with that, I'd like to pick, pass it over to Jeff. Thanks, Don. So what I'm gonna do now at this point is talk about the data that we've now identified in Capture and how it works with the various processes. So as Don explained in the previous slide, we've reverse engineered stuff, uh, data from a physical system. Then we've more or less transformed that into a higher level of abstraction, which is a logical data model. So at a logical level, really talking about data elements or elements of data that the business cares about. So if we look at this particular slide here, this is how we're gonna take a look at the data and how it maps to the process. So if you look at this thing, I've got check customer credit. Now check customer credit is a process that this business executes, but what data is required to execute this? And if we look at this uh, data usage here, we can see that we've got uh, some instance of a customer, we've got some instance of uh, consent verification and some instance of customer credit. You'll also notice that next to that, there is the R and the C and the, and the U referring to CRUD. So now we can document where the data actually gets created. Is this process actually reading data that was previously created by another process? Or is this the actual process that generates or creates the data? So we're more or less mapping data to process at this point. So now, if we look at this, there is an indicator in the upper right-hand corner of this process symbol uh, saying that it's dealing with private or sensitive information. So that's an indicator uh, that this is a process that has high visibility and also has uh, uh, some high risk uh, of, uh, associated with it as well. So now if we take a look at this data process flow, now that we know that there is data and that data is associated with a process, the data can be stored in some sort of storage component, a database or a flat file or some other mechanism by which we're holding that information. But also the information is passing from one process to another process. So we need to be able to understand that data gets created somewhere, it moves to another process where it's read and stored. And then that process in turn creates more data that gets sent out to other processes where it's uh, uh, read and stored. So it's really looking at the scope of all processes that are dealing with certain pieces of data that we have deemed to be uh, risky. And so we have to look at all of this stuff when we're examining this. And if we look in the lower right hand corner here, you, saw, you have a, a window for the data usage for the fulfill customer order. And here we can see that the name customer is actually being read, but it was actually created when the order was placed. So customer order generated from placing the customer order, but when we're gonna fulfill the customer's order, we're more or less reading it. So it's more or less showing how data flows throughout the system.
So if we look at the process to data matrix here, we're really looking where the rows are, which is the actual pieces of data, and the columns are indicating what the process is. And the intersection there we can see between call customer and the customer row is read, and you can see the customer credit row and the call customer actually has the creation stuff. So we can actually see where data is created and where data is read. So now that we know that we have data, we know that some process is either consuming the data or creating the data, what we really wanna do is to take that concept of, of a process and align it with a system that actually captures that information and records it in some database somewhere. So if we look at this, across the top, you may have a, uh, a process value flow or a process chain, um, but at some point, uh, that information is captured within a system. So if we look at these various rectangles here, you can see that there's an accounting system, and that accounting system might have subsystems, and there might be even more subsystems to that. In other instances, there's an actual application that's part of the system that relates back to the database and some reference to some artifacts that might be uh, generated from the system, such as an inventory report or a sales report. So what we're really now doing is jumping over to the system part of things. So when we're looking at this here, we're now saying the process to application map. So I know I've got a process and I know I've got an application. What is the intersection between a process and an application? So when we think about processes, we can think of them in one of two ways. There are processes that people do, which are manual uh, people-oriented processes, but there are also processes that machines do or software machines do. So some of these things might be actually embedded within the system or they may be external to the system, but they're stored in the system somewhere. So we need to know what that intersection is. So system to application. So we know that we can have systems and subsystems. We know that there are processes that are represented by uh, these certain systems. And the application itself is the, the component to the end user where you're interfacing with this. So you've got a, an application that is part of a system and the application is what more or less ties back to the database itself. So the idea here, if we look in the lower right hand corner, we can have a sales application and a marketing application, but they're all considered part of the customer relationship management system. So you can have one system that may have many applications. So in each one of these, we need to know about the consent verification, whether this information has been uh, consented by the customer to allow us to capture and store that. So we need to be able to say, as part of the application, that this is one of two things. It's an application that's dealing with some data that's of high risk, and it's also an acknowledgement that we captured that information uh, and the customer has consented to that capture. Also notice here, the same little icon that we previously used on a process is also on the actual uh, data storage unit here. So this indicates that uh, the data that's stored in this database contains uh, sensitive and risky information. Um, so we have to be able to catalog that and be able to map to that when we're doing some analysis later on. Great, so let's talk, let's talk a bit about those check marks and what do they represent? Well, when you talk about consent, we talk about private and sensitive data, and very definitely what we have to deal with is the notion that we have to get that check mark. We have to get the explicit consent, and it has to be clear, and it has to be affirmative. Also, there's an interesting part of this, too, now, that the consent must be verifiable. So as Jeff was saying, every time we see that checkbox, and yes, we build into the application that consent was given, we also have to understand that it must be verifiable, going back to one of the notes earlier on privacy by design, to provide that, tran that transparency and to verify that it was actually done. Interesting part of this as well, if consent is given explicitly, it can also be taken away. But today what we see a lot of is the notion of implicit consent. 
And I'm sure you're seeing a lot of these showing up now as the cookie boxes, if you will, as they show up on screens that said, yeah, you know, if you're going to use this, uh, you consent to everything we do because, you know, you've said you would. And again, so a lot of it is implicit that says, well, we have a privacy policy. And by the way, how many people actually read it? And when you look at it, it just says, if you accept this, you also accept everything that's in that privacy policy. Well, the question is, what's in that privacy policy? Well, what you will find, other than what was going to be coming with GDPR about explicit consent, is it has to look more like something like this, where you have to say positively, yes, sign me up, or a click upon it that says sign me up, or you have to enter your email. What we see a lot more of today is things like when you buy something, it is implied that we're going to use all that data for other marketing and selling of your data to other people. Certainly things like freebies. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Obviously, when you do a free download or a free app, the collection of information that you're providing them is then passed along and sold. And, of course, the simplest thing we know of is things like exchanging business cards. Is there an implication that you have explicitly consented that when you handed somebody a business card that they can then use the information that's on that card for whatever purpose they feel like. The other interesting situation we see today is the notion of opting in or opting out. So I did look at one of those privacy policies of one of the websites who had the cookies. And this is the kind of thing it said. It said, you, we can prevent your data from being used by Google Analytics because we assume that if you clicked on the approval of the cookie, that you accept the fact that we will use Google Analytics and Adobe Marketing. So the point is, it's not opt out anymore, which is what you have to do today with these pri privacy policies. But explicit consent really is the notion of opting in. In other words, having the, the person who is collecting the party that is collecting your data explicitly state to you what is their intent of collecting this data, which is potentially more than just the completion of a business order. And the one I found particularly interesting is this notion that if we sell, merger, or otherwise dilute the uh, get rid of the assets of a particular company by somebody buying us, all of the information that we have collected about you is now transferable in that sale. In point of fact, it's one of the few places where we actually see data as an asset on a financial statement of an organization, typically called goodwill. Well, guess what? No, you cannot sell the data to somebody else if you've collected for the express purpose of a transaction. In point of fact, this is what the world will look like under GDPR. The explicit consent starts with no. I do not give you consent to collect, distribute, or utilize my data. However, if when asked, I will authorize it, but I have to know exactly how that consent was given and I have to record it somewhere. So now that I permit it for you to use, there also has to be the notion of a period for which I can use it. It's not forever. So you also have to record what the period is and then frankly, what happens at the end of it. And as I'd mentioned earlier, if you can give permission explicitly, you can also revoke it. So the whole notion of forgetting who I am or erasing who I am is a very critical element of GDPR, and it's going to be one of the most difficult things to do once you start collecting a person's data. Jeff. Thanks, Don. So just as sort of a recap here, when Don was talking about data privacy by design, he was talking about the requirement to capture some consent a mechanism by which we can actually store that consent, which is what we did in the data model, where we added a column to a table that, that says customer consent verified. Now we have to be able to associate that with a process and then have some sort of, let's say, graphical symbol that tells us that that information contains or that process contains information about consent. Uh, this helps us when we do the analysis later because we might have thousands and thousands of processes within an organization, but there is only a certain subset of those processes that are of a high enough risk that we need to evaluate them. So here within the tooling, we need to be able to mark it as something that needs to be uh, evaluated as well as making sure that we have the column or the mechanism by which we can either add a checkbox or some other indicator that says that consent was given. So here, when we talk about looking at the entire organization, there's lots of different processes that are within a particular business function or 
business capability. So in this perspective, we're looking at the whole concept of from the time we receive an order to the time that that order uh, is posted to the general ledger, ledger as money having been received into the into the company, we need to evaluate all of those things and we need to find out where within each one of those functions and then those functions may actually have processes and sub-processes and storages that we need to look at. So we're really looking at making sure that we look at the entire function of an organization to make sure we're hitting everything. So monitoring it. So it's one thing to say that we need to do it because that's of course the design. Design says that yeah, we have a requirement and then we need to design the, fact, uh, the ability to capture that. But then there's the ongoing monitoring, like are we actually doing it? So we do have a little mechanism that is the customer consent verified column. We just need to be able to go ahead and run a report that will tell us what applications uh, that are part of what systems um, either have or don't have that check mark in that particular box. So we've now added to our regular reports for the customer relationship management system uh, beyond just quarterly sales reports and sales rep performance reports to now have a general data protection regulatory conformance report. So we just need to make sure that we are continually monitoring and managing the process uh, around this idea of consent. So let's talk a bit now about lawful processing. What it basically says, as we said before, that consent is provided by a data subject. However, the processing of the collection of the data that was explicitly consented has to be to fulfill the contract between the data subject and the data controller and it almost is exactly that contract, that when I provide you my information, contractually it is for this thing and this thing alone. And again, compliance is now a legal obligation as part of the rules of processing of GDPR. Again, the reason fundamentally is protect the, the interests of the data subject. And that's going back to the notion of having the individual copyright of a person. And the performance intact of the public interest as well must be taken into account. Obviously, when we're dealing with private data, there are certain aspects of governmental responsibility and things around it, criminal behavior and other things that are superseded from the GDPR. But fundamentally, it is the protection of the data subject within the context of the greater public interest. And again, we see that in, in terms of legitimate interests outside by a controller or third party where the interests are overridden around rights of freedom, around the data subject, and things that are for the public good. So this is not a situation where all things are private for everything. It is basically to protect the data subject, but also to protect the general populace as well. So around that is the notion of data minimization. The cartoon there says basically, let, get all the information you can, we'll find a use for it later. That is not the intent, and in fact, that is the converse of the intent of the law. The data minimization is about only collecting enough data to fulfill the contractual obligation between the data subject and the data controller. So if we look at the value chain then, we have our data subject controlling and copywriting their information, and they have this explicit contract with the data controller who is part of the European Union. But industry, interestingly enough, when we get into the notion of B2B in business to business, we have these data processors who in fact do business on behalf of the data controller. And in point of fact, some of those may actually be outside the EU. The point being, however, that if it was information about a person of a member state of the EU, irrespective of where the processing happened, irrespective of who the data controller or the data processor was, that the accountability goes back to an individual and the organization that did the collection of the data in the first place. So really what that deals with is something called Article 30, which is the responsibilities of data controllers and data processors. Again, it is the name and contact details of the actual individual in the organization who is deemed to be the data controller or data processor. There has to be that definition of what the contract was. Effectively, what was the purpose of the processing? Going back to our first 
uh, webinar, we talked about categorization of data. So you have to have and provide and provide transparency and visibility of the categories of the data subjects and the personal data associated with it. You also have to provide the recipients of the personal data as to what information was moved from the data controller to a data processor. And in point of fact, that may happen in countries outside of the EU member nations or international organizations. One of the biggest elements we've added to this now is the whole notion, again, from the inventory world about LIFO and FIFO, last in, first out, first in, first out, that there have to be time limits now associated with the collection. It is not collect it once and keep it forever. And again, this may be based on categories of data or it may be based on part of the explicit consent process. Aside from that, of course, now we have to understand that the technical and organizations must provide adequate security measures. We talk about the notion of a gated community. This is not the guard at the front gate. These are technical and organizational security measures that exist all the way through the processing from analytical back to the individual collection. Jeff. Thanks, Don. So as Don mentioned, it is uh, location sensitive. So if we look at this example here on the left side of the screen is the uh, corporate headquarters for a certain organization. And they have a hardware server which is running their CRM application. But the CRM application is actually storing the data via the network over in the EU inside of a data center that's on a different hardware server. So what we really need to be able to do is to document where is the information captured, what, what uh, application captured it, and then where does it ultimately come to rest? Where is it stored? Because that is of particular importance to the GDPR as to uh, whether you're subject to the regulation or not. Also, we have to be able to identify of all the databases in the data center, which ones will contain the information that's uh, crucial to uh, the GDPR. So we need to be able to mark that and identify that so that we can trace it when we need to investigate it. So some Semantic lineage. This gets back to the whole concept of metadata and the idea of, let's say, customer, because it's a pretty ubiquitous example. If we look at a customer, the customer can have a different meaning depending on who you're talking to. So if I'm talking to a salesperson, they'll say, oh, the customer, well, that's the person that uh, bought the product from us. If I'm talking to somebody in, let's say, finance or billing, they're going to tell me, well, the customer is the person that's going to get the bill. And if I talk to somebody on a loading dock, the customer is the guy who's actually going to sign for the shipment. So we need to be able to understand uh, what is the definition of a customer. So in this case, we have a, just a generic definition of a party that receives or consumes products and has the ability to choose between different products. But we need to be able to say that instance of a customer may be related to a process, a system, an application, a screen, all kinds of stuff. So this has to do with what is the downstream analysis of the idea or the definition of what is a customer. So in talking about downstream analysis and upstream analysis, we're really talking about, you know, what is the end to end? So this, this example here, is really saying if I need to follow something from um, upstream and follow it downstream or something that's already downstream and follow it upstream or something that's somewhere in the middle, I need to be able to um, identify this stuff. So all this stuff that we've been talking about as far as importing data into um, you know, the process models, assigning that data to a particular process, um, associating that process with a system and then that system has an application, that application has maybe a form or a web page where we're capturing this consent. Um, that lineage is built uh, so that we can do this kind of analysis and understand all the different places that we need to ensure that we are monitoring and managing this information. So, <clears throat> 
In addition to that, we also need to understand how the data flows, because this is primarily a data-driven idea in that we're managing the personal and sensitive information. So, you know, lots of times when you look at this, you say, well, sure, we need to be able to uh, look at uh, where we're capturing the customer's information. That's the critical uh, process that we're looking at here. But in reality, when we start to see that customer information is now flowing to the idea that we're fulfilling the customer's order, so customer information about what their address is and where we're going to ship it to starts to flow through the system and look at other process. And those other processes talk to other processes and send other information. So we really have to be wary of the scope of where this data is moving throughout the organization. And to sum it all up, that is uh, the essence of what we're talking about here with data risk management. We need to be able to have some sort of inventory, as Don was talking about before, which is we have a concept of a customer. That customer touches what? It touches a process. It touches a system. It touches an application. It touches a web page. It moves from one point to another point. It's stored in the US. It's stored in the EU. Uh, somebody's a processor, somebody uh, else is processing information on behalf of the company. We need to be able to look at all of that stuff and to begin, well, two things. How much exposure do we have? What is our risk? But then also, how do we start to mitigate this? Because we obviously have to solve this problem. So we need to be able to look at okay, we've got hundreds of processes, but which processes are the ones that are the most critical? And that has to do with this idea that we need to mark them or somehow identify that those processes as being more critical than other processes. Same thing with the data, certain data more critical than other data, certain systems more critical than other systems. If we're gonna retire one system and merge information into another system, we need to know that, that, that personal data may be going into that system. So that all sort of brings all this together in this idea of uh, risk management. Back to you, Don. Thank you, Jeff. So hopefully what you've seen is some evidence of what process means to the GDPR regulations, and certainly how with the aid of some mechanisms and some tools and technologies, we can help you to automate that process. Just stepping a little higher, taking a step back a bit, all the work that we do today, we think is in a frame of doing good data management. And when we looked for a framework to help us decide what was the best way to describe data management, we came upon the CMMI's data management maturity model. And as Robert had mentioned earlier, I am certified with the, the CMMI as a, one of their assessors. So we start to look at things then in terms of private and sensitive data in the context of data management and specifically within data governance. Within that context then, as we looked at the first session, we talked about data governance, which is really about the form or the structure of data. And we also talked about the notion of data quality. That's the content, and it's really data qualification, not just data quality. So when it comes to this part of the discussion, we're really now talking about life cycle modeling. How, in fact, that private and personal data in structure and content is processed throughout the system. So if we look at the data, the life cycle capabilities then within the notion of data operations of the DMM. Again, we're looking for the best practices and for doing the data requirements, the managing, the implementing the data across the entire supply chain that Jeff alluded to a little earlier. So within that, again, we're now talking about data requirements definition, data life cycle management, as we saw from its relationship to how it is processed. In fact, that's part of the CRUD, the create, review, update, and delete. And certainly delete is going to become a very critical aspect to understand as we do this modeling. And the other notion of provider management, again, typically was just the inputs and outputs of data that we either collect from an outside agency or provide to. But now with the notion of the data supplier and the data controller, that whole notion of provider management is going to require a fairly significant level of maturity to attain. So in summary, as we talk about what we're looking to with the private and sensitive information, we talked in the initial web one about the form and structure of data. So we're talking about the data modeling technologies and things we can do there about building data structure models. And we also talked about data qualification. And then in that context, we talked about building the data content models. 
So I hope you see now we've added the data system model here, which is adding the life cycle notion to the metadata inventory that now we can go from a business process to an application, once again, meeting in the middle, and then providing that data system model into that inventory. So now, when we have data and process brought together, we see that in form, substance, and life cycle, from structure, content, and processing, we now have the complete picture we put in the metadata inventory. And once again, this further involves us in something called metadata intelligence, as Jeff alluded to, that the fact that we put all these different models that we've collected into the inventory, we can now do traceability, monitoring, measurement to make sure that we are in compliance and we can do the, reduce the risk of being non-compliant. So in summary, if you collect personal data in the EU from a e member or a data subject that is a member of an EU state, it's not just about data technology or security anymore. It has to be more than just a security technology and a policy. You better have the data models, which identify the private data throughout your landscape. And you better have the flow that shows where the data is used. Uh, we've seen this before. If you ever remember the good old SSY2K, where the first thing that everybody said you needed to do was get an inventory of all the data you needed. Well, that boat sailed. So the new boat in town, the GDPR, and frankly, the necessities are the same. And as I've been standing there over the years when I was around for Y2K, it's the same message. You need to collect and manage your metadata. So with that, I'd like to get over to Robert. Thanks, Don. Uh, I'd like to thank you and Jeff and our friends at Irwin for their insights and uh, for your insights and the contributions to part two of our webcast. Hopefully organizations are beginning to understand that there's a lot of ground to cover. However, our latest estimates indicate that at least 50% have yet to start to address the issues around GDPR. As we mentioned at the beginning, our technology partner Irwin has a data foundation platform that allows for the sharing of any metadata or business process artifact across the entire enterprise. While we have shown Irwin BP, there are several other solutions that are all coming together in Irwin's unified data management platform. As business and applications systems need to become more transparent and auditable, clients will need to leverage solutions like Irwin BP. For clients interested in learning more about how Irwin BP can deliver on this, please contact me at the address below. So hopefully, uh, with part one and now part two, you can see that GDPR is not a simple fix. Sandhill believes that it all starts with a comprehensive assessment of the potential impact and the realization that data is your business and that business could be compromised by non-compliance. This is where Santel can help. We believe that the approach to achieving compliance while reducing the risk of substantial financial penalties is a combination of the right people with the right processes and technologies at the right time. So how would you get started? In our opinion, you need, you need a map. And the CMM DMM is the map that we would use. We then need to know where you're at, where you want to go, how you'd get there. And that's where Santel assessment comes in. This assessment is a critical component of identifying the entire data ecosystem. With over 27 different areas, uh, we assess the entire data managed enterprise and help you to help you to get to where you need to be. For more information on our DMM assessment, please contact Robert Levin at Santel Consultants. Finally, in our third and final webcast on GDPR, the focus will be on enterprise governance, where we will take a look at accountability, data breach, data erasure, and data portability. Please see the link in the uh, following slide for the upcoming presentation for September the 26th, 2017. We'd like to thank you all for your time and participation, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future, and our thanks to our speakers as well. Thank you.
fight. 